friends, and welcome back to the Rewind Podcast of Forward Church. Join us each week as we take a look back on Sunday's message and dig a little deeper into the conversations with those who are teaching across our sites at Forward. We want to invite you to be part of the conversation too. So if something we're talking about on Sunday morning sparks a question in you, head to our website forwardchurch.ca slash ask us and submit your questions there. And we're going to do our best to engage with those questions in this space. With that said, let's jump in and get started. Hey, Rewind friends. I bet you weren't expecting to see me again because, shocker, someone in Blair's family is sick. It's astonishing to me that this could happen again. Not again. Honestly. Like, if you are a faithful Rewind friend... uh, you know that uh, Blair and her family have been under it. So if you just want to pray for them regularly, mm-hmm. that would be mm-hmm. wonderful. They are uh, often under it. And I know as a parent of young kids, uh, it's just sort of a loop of insanity. So we're stuck with Andrew. <laughs> Again, sorry. <laughs> when, when I got an email on Monday morning from Blair, yeah, uh, we know. We know, we know what's, what's happening. happening. <laughs> yeah. That's too bad. Uh, poor Blair. Scene, she so. was very disappointed. I talked to her last night. She, she was like, oh, I really want to be there. And I yeah. said, let me just like take that yeah. away from you. Just focus on the kids. and Yeah. So pray for Blair and for Steve. And pray for, for us girls. as we get Andrew. I'm sorry. That's all I can do is just <laughs> repent and ask the questions that you guys sent in. That's my whole MO. Um, so I want to start with this. Uh, Daryl, you specifically was listening to your message, and I noticed that you mm-hmm. made multiple MCU, uh, for those of you who don't know what that means, Marvel Cinematic Universe uh, references. You had, I a did. Gu- yeah. had a Guardian of the Galaxy, and then you had an Infinity War, which Infinity War is my favorite oh. in the MCU. Okay. And so I wondered, I know both Good. of you guys nerd out on some Marvel stuff from time to time. Uh, so I'm going to start by giving you the chance to tell me your favorite uh, MCU film. Oh, my favorites. Oh, man, that's tough. Um, that's a tough one. Probably my favorite would be, got to go with the original Iron Man. Okay. The very, the very first one. That is, uh, that's probably the best. And I really, I, did, I mean, I really enjoy the Tom Holland, um, his whole Spider-Man story arc has been very solid. That's, okay. that's my top. All right. All right. Pro- probably Thor Ragnarok. Really? Yeah. Nice. I Ooh. just like the laughs. Okay. I, I, I'm, I, I find that movie very funny. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Thor. And did- I just love the way, like, it's just so different from the first couple yeah. Thor movies and just to- totally, like, turns everything on its head, lets Chris Hemsworth stretch his comedic chops. and Yeah. Yeah. It was definitely a movement. Yeah. In in the MC. Okay. All right. I'll yeah. allow it. Now, on to more. Uh, Plus, this is just a great rock, paper, scissors joke <laughs> in it. So, <laughs> a lot of good dad jokes in there. Yes. Yeah, it's fair. My, my favorite yeah. mon- moment was the get help scene. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> you guys can pull this out of your hats uh, way more uh, efficiently than I did. And I'm the only one wearing a hat. Yeah. So. But, by the way, when you said I, I reference uh, some MCU movies, I didn't even realize that I did that until you just <laughs> mentioned it just now. Yeah. I didn't even realize. Because you had the Guardians of the Galaxy. So, that was just in there. You know, that's yeah. just, that's just, that's just, that's just yeah. pouring. It's, it's emanating it's from part who of are. who he is. Yeah. 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 That, you're, that's, you're welcome. You're you welcome. guys can reference scenes and I'm like, oh yeah, there was several Thor movies and I can't remember which one that one was. <laughs> if it was so, funny, it was probably yeah. Thor Ragnarok. That's fair. <laughs> no, I, I was a Guardians of the Galaxy guy too. Guardians of the Galaxy also just like la- tons of laughs. Yeah. I, I, also, the first two Ant Man movies I think are criminally underrated. Also, yeah. because of Paul Rudd being, being just a, funny, a funny, endearing human being. It's true. But, but Andrew, a question for you then. You said Infinity War, one of your favorites. Yeah. Why? Uh, I love basically what you referenced and why people hated it. I love complexity. the The mm-hmm. complexity of the Thor character and his both adoration for Gamora and choosing to sacrifice her, like the complexity of the Thor character uh, and the emotional tension of, uh, you know, uh, who's the dude? Um, Doctor Strange coming back with that, like, this is how we got to do it. I would say that that's the film where they were brave enough to give the characters full story arcs. Yeah. And since then, it has been a lot of, like, fart jokes. Wah, wah. So yeah. if so they could I, go back big fan. to that. If they could, Personally, over here. <laughs> that's where Derek really got invested. <laughs> there's, a, there's a graph somewhere. Uh, if they could somehow get back to that heart. Um, yeah. He didn't say fart. Uh, oh, yeah. It's going to uh, make 
the same comment. Oh, man. Okay. I'm going to try my best. I said before we started recording, this one was going to go off the rails, and we're already there. So let's pull it back. Yeah, I'm going to sue you if it doesn't. Uh, <laughs> okay, all right. So Ooh, you look at just. That. Oh, that's. Wow. That's, I see what you did there. Over there. That's I'm, right. I'm a professional. This podcaster. is not his first rodeo. Yeah, yeah, okay, so yeah. we're jumping into 1 Corinthians 6. We're talking about lawsuits. So, Daryl, because you've already paid homage to your uh, message, I'd love for you just to give us in a couple of sentences. Uh, what you wanted people to walk away from. Yeah, absolutely. So a big point from the message is that really just want to touch on, it, it's really not about the lawsuits. It's yeah. really the heart behind it. So really what Paul is getting at is that unhealthy reactions will lead to unhealthy relationships. And so well, if you are a follower of Christ, that means that you're going to respond to conflict. You're going to respond mm-hmm. to being wronged in a very different way. Uh, and he roots all of this into our new identity that we have in Christ. And so I wanted people to wrestle through with that and then start to think through the, in your life now, uh, who do you need to forgive? Who have you wronged? Mm-hmm. Uh, this has some really uh, immediate application yeah. to our lives. And it gets uncomfortable very mm-hmm. quickly when we talk about how we actually forgive someone who's actually wronged us. It's not easy. And Paul explains it's hard. Yeah, yeah, and I think the questions this week will reflect that that there is some sort of like that emotional complexity to this process. It, the scripture's clear, but that doesn't mean it's easy. So, Derek, uh, I loved how you sort of meandered into the. It took this, a little time, yeah. up front, just kind of helping us recognize that in a fallen world, uh, conflict and community kind of are synonymous with one another. Yeah, and so I know we had a hallway conversation on Monday about that. I'd love you just sort of give us a snapshot of that. Why you why you took that route into the conversation, yep. and then the like one or two sentence wrap up of what you tried to say after. Yeah, that. I think one of the dangers we face um, as Christians in Christian community is we can have an idealized view of what community is going to look like in a Christian context, and that. We're not going to have to do, if we were really like, if we all really loved Jesus enough, then we just wouldn't have conflict. And so Mm -hmm. this church or this community, there must be something significantly wrong with it because there's conflict here. So I'm going to go find the next one because eventually I'll find the perfect community where there's no conflict. But the Mm -hmm. reality is in a fallen world with fallen people, we're going to have conflict. What should set us apart as a Christian community is how we then handle that conflict. We've got resources uh, and and reasons to handle the conflict in a different way than the world around us, right? So the resource is exactly what Daryl said. We've got this identity in Christ, and we've got the example of Christ who laid down his rights to right our wrongs. Mm -hmm. And then um, the reason we have is that also the way that we interact reflects on our Savior, reflects on Christ, right? So, And I love that. Just both of you guys are pretty crystal clear, like, this is going to happen, guys. Like, stop, yeah. stop living in a world in your head where you're not going to have conflict. That yeah. is a, I think both of you referenced kids, right? Like, you don't need to like tell a parent like, like this is an expectation you should have that your kids are going to fight. It's going to be difficult at times. Yep. Human beings get in conflict. We are like we could say even if we removed every person and we were on our own. Almost all of us are self-conflicted in yeah, some way because really of the sin point, yeah. that's in us. So you can't even say, if I just got rid of everybody else, I yeah. would never have conflict. Yeah, you hear you heard jokes, I'm sure, before of like, oh, you know, this job would be so much easier if it wasn't for the people or yeah. whatever, right? Then I made like, one of those. This is a good pastor joke. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a well-traveled pastor joke. I don't know that it's a good one. <laughs> those are two different things. But I love that you guys both constantly came back to this mm. identity in Christ. And Derek, there's one uh, question directed uh, specifically sure. to you. Uh, it said that Derek mentioned that when we're secure in our identity in Christ, we will have an easier time assuming the best in people, which I, I my ears were perked at that too. Yeah. So it follows up. As Christians, are we supposed to assume the best in people, even though that we know that natural tendency of every human is depra- depravity and wickedness? So Yeah, I, I, I think <laughs> let's... Yes, you can know that depravity, we believe in total mm-hmm. depravity, which, which by the way, does not mean that every person is as bad as they could possibly be in every right. area of life. Yeah. It just means that sin infects yeah. and affects every part of who we are as a mm-hmm. human being. There's no part of us that's untouched by by the sin nature, and yeah. there's no part of the world then that is touched by the sin nature, which means community too. Mm-hmm. 
But I think a lot of Christians operate out of a lens of distrust and cynicism yeah. that is okay. destructive to the soul. Um, to the, to your own soul, is that what you're saying? To your own okay. soul, but it also infects and affects the people around you. You can't have relationships with other people if when you are hmm. always constantly reading people, you're assuming things, wrong motives, okay. bad behaviors into them, right? So let me give you let me give you one example. Somebody doesn't say hello to you while you're out at a store at Costco. And your immediate because you always see church people at Costco, right? (laughs) And your immediate response is, "Oh, they must have something against me, Hmm. right? Oh, they must not like me." Trying to avoid me, they're trying to avoid me. When, like, I can tell you from. By the way, if you bump into me, assume that like you're gonna actually have to run into my face in a store (laughs) for me to notice you there. Amanda will tell you this. Like, I just I. Uh, if I'm driving along the road, I don't notice my own family while they're walking in the neighborhood. It's just not the way that I process the hmm. world. But for some people, they're going to assume, oh, the like ooh, the, that pastor is unfriendly. He doesn't know me. He doesn't notice me. We've assumed motives without any evidence that those things are true. We've assumed hmm. the worst things. Yeah. And if you are... <laughs> If you're secure in your identity in Christ, you're not constantly trying to pick out the faults and flaws with people. You're not constantly dealing with those insecurities. And you won't, um, you you, you will have the capacity to just assume, oh, they didn't, they probably didn't see me. (laughs) Right? Yeah. Like that's assuming the best. I'm not, unless, unless like you yell out their name, they look at you and turn away and keep and walk in the other direction. Yeah. And you've got some good reason to say, for sure. Yeah. There's something there. Hmm. Now, if you are in that spot where you just struggle with these things of assuming the worst in people, then you actually have a responsibility. And your responsibility is to go to the person and say, hey, I, I, I saw you in Costco the other day. Is and you didn't say hi. Is there something going on there? Right. So the person has the opportunity to explain themselves, right? And you have the ability to release that thing, yeah, and not go tell somebody else. You know that person's such a jerk. I mean, here's yeah. the list of things I've been keeping track. I mean, there's just a totally different perspective. I'll give you a quote from Spurgeon because it, it uh, it's always good. Spurgeon yeah. does tend to throw fire at times. Yeah. yeah. So Spurgeon said it would be better to be deceived a hundred th- times than to live a life of suspicion to his students. Hmm. Um, it, 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 so what he's saying is it, like it's better to miss a possible offense in an email that's sent to me. Right. Or a possible insult or a possible slight in that text or tweet than it is to always be looking for the offense and for the slight and right. assuming it when we live in the age of microaggressions right that's where it's yeah. like we kind of go looking for the offense that somebody has done against me right and that's what i'm talking about we don't go looking for offense we assume the best i think that's that's really great yeah uh so daryl i'm gonna throw a slightly different question to you so sure. both of you guys identified the fact that like you know the first half of First Corinthians 6 is talking about lawsuits between believers, but what we're talking about today isn't really that. Like, that's not the topic du jour. Yeah. So would you help us to understand as we continue on through this conversation, what are we talking about? What are the things that are really the, you know, modern-day translations of that? If, you know, you're not off the hook because you haven't recently <laughs> filed the lawsuit against somebody. Yeah, I, I think the the application... Uh, the heart behind this is, is not just the the lawsuit, but it is actually dealing with a wrong. Um, as you said, like we, uh, Derek and I both pointed out, like, hey, like you're going to be wronged. Like mm-hmm. that's that's pretty clear from the very beginning of the passage. Uh, but like, how are you going to respond? It's not just with a lawsuit. That is an improper way to respond to someone. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we can respond incorrectly by uh, blowing up on the person, just okay. really getting yeah. like like overly angry with them and like you're not going to let them leave the room until you tell them exactly what they think of you not saying hi to me at Costco, <laughs> Derek. Uh, <laughs> it would be Derek of all of our passwords. I, I would, <laughs> I'm not even going to hear him because I still got my AirPods in with noise canceling. So yeah, I, I, it, he'd be really fresh at the end. I'd say, oh, sorry, are you talking yeah. to me? <laughs> oh, Daryl, I didn't even notice you there. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so like you can, you can overreact that way. You can um, also react the other way like, like you're just not going to bring it up. Like you're just yeah. going to avoid the conflict 
Uh, I think what's happening in this passage, if you pair and you should like chapter five and chapter six side by side and right. chapter five, what what's happening there is that, you know, they have sin going on within the church and they're kind of avoiding it. They kind of have this yeah. pride of, okay. of, Hey, like, you know, we're, we're above all of this. And, uh, and so he confronts them on that. But then in chapter six, he's saying, but some of you are, have taken this the opposite direction. Okay. That you are, like some of you are, are afraid to judge. And now some of you are judging everyone. And like you're literally taking mm. them to the court, which in this culture, court was not kind of kept behind, you know, closed doors. It was a very public affair. It was court and TV. So, uh, you know, it was it was, Judge Judy. <laughs> no, it was, literally was uh, oftentimes a source of entertainment that people would go in and just go down and watch what was taking in, place at the court in huh. the in okay. the center of town. Yeah. Like, hey, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna get some ruling by by the judges by the it's, people. It's it's basically like going on to Twitter and okay. just just to pop the popcorn and watch the the world burn. Okay, so it's yeah. so it's very much <laughs> functionally the like the court of popular opinion almost. Yeah, there's a judge there, right? Yeah. But but people are coming to like see, see the gossip, see right? all this yeah. unfold. Okay. Yeah. Right. When when you don't that's have the internet, people find ways to entertain themselves. Yeah. Uh, and that's that's what they did back then. And so. the only thing that's changed is you can do it on your phone now. You don't have to actually go to the village square. Yeah, and, and I think that's probably a good modern comparison mm. where rather than directly so what he really wants you to do is is to directly deal with this per, with the person, especially if they're a brother or sister in Christ. Right. Um, that we need to go to them, and you know Jesus makes this really clear in, in the Gospels, where he says, "Say hey, if if a brother has sinned against you, go to him directly. If he won't hear, bring a couple other people, and then if they won't hear that, bring it before the entire church." It's kind of like this escalating thing mm -hmm. as you bring in more of the saints into the situation. But he's saying here in chapter six, like some of you are so eager to judge that you are, you're bringing this in front of other non-Christians. This right. is hurting your testimony uh, and it's hurting like your own soul. Like right. you are not living out the way that Christ has called you to live. And so that's really the conflict that's happening here. Mm. And so we have to be uh, cautious of how we're going to deal with with wrongs and with conflict in our lives. So we don't want to avoid it. Uh, we don't want to just explode on someone. Yeah, put it on and full a, display. I would say the the more common way that we deal with conflict is that instead of talking with the person, addressing it directly, we we tend to talk with everyone else about it. Yeah, yeah. you you bring in a close friend, a family member, a discipleship group, and say, hey, I don't know if you guys have heard about this. We we tend to gravitate towards that because it, it feels like you're dealing with the issue, but, um, you're, not. but you're actually not. Well, Psychology so. would call that triangulation. You're adding a third point uh, to yeah. run interference. In and, that. And, yeah. and within the context of community, it's incredibly destructive. And I was, it is. community is a key word because I was thinking as you're walking through the Matthew 18 model and sort of adding those saints, I loved how you said that, and sort of you're, you know, walking into the conversation today, that's the element is a healthy community. Yeah. So that when you're dealing with the person in the community, you can do that in a healthy way. And if it goes poorly, you have mature men and women of God who you can bring in one or two at a time or having a discipleship group speaking in. And I think you referenced having that like a mediated presence. It's yeah. not like, let me bring my posse with me to tell right. you how well, yeah, you let, did that wrong. Let me bring yeah. the extra force. And we've all been discussing over here how wrong you are. Yeah. And now we're going to confront you as a group. Yeah. It's it's a mature, in that Matthew 18 model, it's a mature, yeah. godly uh, voice to moderate a conversation because you're just not seeing eye to eye. I, I can tell you in so many counseling conversations, the primary role of a counselor becomes that mediator to help people who mm -hmm. just aren't hearing each other, yeah, right? Yeah, that's a good way. We talk, it. when Amanda and I do um, premarital preparation classes, premarital counseling, whatever you want to call it, we talk all the time about communication mm -hmm. and how we have these filters yeah. that our communication runs through. So we think we're saying something, and because of the filters that the other person has in their life, past experiences, even how their day has gone that day, yeah, that's fair. what they hear is not what we intend to say. Mm -hmm. And so they've heard a very different message than we've communicated, and yeah. vice versa. Mm -hmm. And, and um, in good communication, healthy communication between two individuals, you can create a feedback loop yep. where you say, hey, what I heard you say here was, is that what you intended yeah. to say? But we get to a point oftentimes where uh, the, our emotional skin is so 
so burned. Mm -hmm. uh, there's so much baggage maybe in a relationship or just maybe in our life where we actually need somebody else to close that loop and yeah. help us hear each other so that we're not talking past one another. That's so good. Such practical advice. Now, I've got, I've got one here that is like deeply, deeply practical. I, I feel like as I'm reading this, this comes from a very <laughs> real place. Okay. Uh, so I'll start with you, Derek. Yep. Uh, rewind question. What about disputes in employment matters? If you're employed by the church or by a fellow church member, violations of worker protections, example, employee standards, yep. aren't a criminal matter, yep. but still result in harm that needs to be addressed. Yep. Hopefully a Christian employer would want to make things right but if the issue can't be resolved internally, is it proper to seek recourse through the courts? Yeah. So uh, I will say that I'm not going to give a definitive answer to this because I think there's a case by case basis. So I want to deal with some principles in here. Okay. That's helpful. And, and then like if the person wants to reach out and has a very specific issue that they want to talk through, happy to talk through with them with their specifics if this is not helpful to them. Right. Okay. So the first thing is, I do think this falls into the category. If you're dealing with a a, a Christian employer, who's a, who's a brother and sister in Christ, then we go through the process, right, of trying to resolve this. Perhaps bringing in mediation. If mediation fails, taking it to the church leadership mm -hmm. to come to the person and say, "Hey, there's an issue here." Um, our our last thing that we should want to do, our our last resort should be going to the courts to sue somebody. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it may be required. The person just is unrepentant. They yeah. just refuse to receive what's being said, and and maybe we have to go there. But then I would still point you to what Paul says to the church in Corinth is like, in this case, is it better for you to suck up and take the loss? Yeah. Mm. Is it isn't it better for you to be wrong? Is this going to drag the name of Jesus through the mud? Yeah, in a way that is hurtful and harmful to the cause of Christ. It's a question that you have to answer. Yeah. I'm not. I don't ask that as like a as a guilting question. Yeah. I do think there's times where to follow to, to walk in the way of Jesus is to search for is to seek seek justice yep. yeah, but yeah. generally that means hey i'm not the only one being it's going to mean i'm not the only one being affected by right. this there is an employer who is consistently taking advantage of other people there's going to be somebody else who walks into my role and for the sake of other people whom i love as well mm -hmm. not just for the sake of my own pride or my own rights i this needs to be addressed i, I can't help but think through what Paul has said multiple times throughout uh, First Corinthians is you can't be self-deceived, though, because it's so easy, it's to, so easy. to pretend so to be easy. a and vigilante. And that's why I just right? think it's so important to bring some other wise Christians into the matter to yeah. to look at this. They will, uh, it, it, they should be able to discern, is this person who's the employer claiming to be a Christian but really not acting in Christ-like ways, mm -hmm. Right. Now, now we've you know if we go to Matthew eighteen and the person refuses to receive the judgment of the church leadership, then we treat them like an unbeliever. Now we're in that spot of a, how does how should a Christian deal with a lawsuit against an unbeliever? Yeah. And again, I I think there's room there for suing, but there's there's always caution. Yeah. We should always weigh that out. It should never be our first response. It's so if I'm going to take the advice you just gave me about how to handle a conversation, yeah. to close the feedback loop. What I think I'm hearing is saying like that in no matter like in that issues of like wisdom and discerning these sorts of things, what should be primary is the name of Jesus. Yeah. So I can't be just like deeply wounded and offended and lash out and say, well, then I'm going to sue you now. We'll my guy. just take you back to exactly what we talk about all the time. What should be primary to you is a love for God mm and a love for others. Yeah. That's, and then that's, that serving the world aspect is like, how does the world receive, how do they see mm. Jesus because yeah, of our that's, actions? That's good. Mm. All right, Daryl, we're going to flip gears here and go right. over to you. So regarding sin, because uh, we're talking about being hurt here and yep. offended sometimes, is all sin forgiv forgivable? And what does it mean to fully embrace forgiveness and know that you can truly, and can you truly be, sure that you've truly forgiven someone. Hmm. So I'm going to say that again because I know yeah. I stumbled over my words there. 
what does it mean to fully embrace forgiveness and know how you can be sure you have fully, truly forgiven someone? Yeah. Um, so tackling that first question of, of forgiveness, can, can any sin be forgiven? And, and I think it's clear in scripture that, uh, that God is able to forgive us all, mm -hmm. no matter what our background is, no matter what we've experienced, um, both in our thought life and in our actions, uh, that God is willing and able to forgive. And, and to believe otherwise would be to believe that you can uh, out-sin the grace of the cross. Hmm. And, and, and Jesus died once for the entire world, for, for all time, um, that all would be able to receive that forgiveness. And so there, there is such beauty and uh, <laughs> so much power in the cross. Uh, so first, I think we have to start there mm -hmm. uh, in this understanding of forgiveness. And, and so how we actually embrace forgiveness is really beginning at that point and understanding what Christ has done for us that we yeah. can now receive that. Uh, and so I think when you receive that type of forgiveness, you, your love for Christ will increase dramatically mm -hmm. once you actually understand like what he has actually done for me. Uh, Jesus is not um, the, the mechanism to receive forgiveness. Like he's the ultimate goal that we're after now. Uh, that our love for him would, would increase. And when we now, in turn, forgive others, uh, I would say like a good indicator of whether you've actually forgiven someone is, is do you actually love that person now? Ooh, that's uh, a good one. I, I think it's incredibly hard to hmm. say, I, I forgive that person who's wronged me, uh, but I, I just I don't want to be in the same room as them. Yeah, and then and there's we're still forgiven. There. We're good. Well, and I don't want to talk to him ever again. I feel like I've had that <laughs> conversation before, actually. I, I know that I felt that before. Yeah. Like I want to forgive someone, um, but man, I just, I don't want to talk. If we could just not talk ever again, I'll be fine. And, and you know, the question there is like, have you actually forgiven? Uh, but I, I think that God honors um, like the way in which we forgive someone. Hmm. Um, what do you mean by that? That, that we, you know, the, the goal here is to forgive, but sometimes we can't get to that point quite yet. What we have okay. to do first is say, God, I desire to forgive this person. Okay. And I think that that like, so the first level is I, I forgive. The second level is God, I, I desire to forgive this mm. wrong. I'm not quite there yet. And a level even before below that is God, I don't even desire to forgive my enemy. This mm. person who has betrayed and hurt me and has caused so much hurt within my family. I don't even desire, and you begin confessing that to Christ. That's good. Um, and, and for some people, that's the place where you need to begin understanding that that's opening the door that God would lead you to the point where you can begin to truly desire to forgive and then ultimately uh, forgive. And, and that's how we take the Lord's Prayer seriously as we're praying through understanding the forgiveness that we've received and now his command, he says, you forgive. If you don't, you will not be forgiven. Like we take that seriously. Yeah. It, the, the words of Jesus right there, we need to take that incredibly seriously and understand that, hey, we're going to live that out imperfectly. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's what I mean by God honors that. He sees the heart's intention and his spirit is moving inside of us to draw us into a more full experience of that forgiveness. That. And that that's the sanctifying process of the spirit inside of us, making us more Christ-like so that through that experience, you'll be uh, more capable of forgiving and truly loving that person um, after you've forgiven them. But that, that can take a long time. That's, that's a journey that can take mm -hmm. days or years or decades, um, but trusting that God is working in you and all of that all along the path can i can i take a stab at this question no with, with uh, i'll give it a one answer one word answer first <laughs> okay so the one word answer is to is it wrong to forgive someone and then love them from a distance the answer is no and then i'm going to give a qualification because i think daryl has done a, a good job mm -hmm. but i think what we need to do is we really need to differentiate because i think people lump them together is forgiveness and reconciliation yeah. Okay. That's right. Good. And I think this is really a question about what is my responsibility in the reconciliation towards the person who has hurt me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Forgiveness is saying, 
I will not exact the the justice or revenge that mm. I am due based on your actions. I yeah. I wipe the charge clean. You're laying that down. Right? I, I would actually disagree with Daryl in that I think you can forgive without feeling it. I think you can. I, and I think ultimately when you forgive, you will end up feeling it. Mm-hmm. But I think the first decision to forgive is always just saying, I... I'm relinquishing my rights. Even to, if it's just pure obedience. Uh, yeah. And ultimately, I think your heart will come along in that. But lots mm. of times you have to do it before you feel it. Uh, okay. You have to choose to lay down your right to revenge and to justice in this. Because that's really what it is. You're saying, yeah. I'm going to bear the cost. I'm going to pay the price. Somebody always pays the price when a wrong is done. Yeah. So either fair. I can try and make you pay it. That's justice, but usually justice for us turns into revenge and vengeance. Mm-hmm. Or I can write it off, and be, and I can write it off. The reason Christians have the uh, inexhaustible ability to write it off is because it's nailed to the cross. Mm-hmm. But right? We can nail it to the cross. Christ has paid the cost, but I'm going to feel it right now. Right. I'm going to live it. But, so, uh, but then the recon- this is where I want to get into the reconciliation, because I think... Yes, you can be you can forgive and not be reconciled, but you cannot forgive and not leave the door open and have a desire for reconciliation. Right. So you can't be pushing them away, but you don't as have a, to be pulling them. As a Christian, close. our desire should always be that we will be reconciled. But if a remember that reconciliation even in in our standing before God requires repentance. Mm-hmm. Okay. And this is where we oftentimes, and this is where abusers will will twist this right. whole concept. This is why we want to be really clear on it, because yeah. I've just dealt with so many people who have abusers in their life who have taken this concept of forgiveness and twisted it yeah. on, on those they abuse. You are not, you're, you have a responsibility to be open to reconciliation, but when there is no repentance, there cannot ultimately be reconciliation. That's good. Daryl, you're trying to jump in there. Is there anything you feel like you need to... Yeah, I was oh. just going to press on, as, as Derek was saying there, of like forgiveness, for that connection between forgiveness and love. Um, but I was going to say, but can you forgive someone and, and still harbor bitterness towards no. them? Cause, no, because yeah. bitterness is is still seeking. It's, it's yeah. your internal way of seeking that they pay the cost, right? You're still right. holding it against them. Yeah. You're so going to you, hold on to this. So you might not fully feel affection yet, but but you can't be on the other exactly. side. Exactly. I'm, right. I'm talking about bitterness. the, you're right, you cannot yeah. harbor bitterness and say yeah. you've forgiven. Right. That, so you, and you can't harbor, you can't say you've forgiven and keep on bringing it back. Yeah. Right. Uh, that's not forgiveness. <laughs> I think I think ultimately what we're we're coming up against here and what makes this whole conversation complex is that there's there is like an understanding of like our identity in Christ, the forgiveness that we've received through the finished work of Jesus and how we feel in the moment when we've been hurted, yeah. hurt and like offended. Uh, or hurted. Up, hurt, I, have, oh, I blended those hurted. two words. I got so hurted. Uh, I've been hurt, hurt or offended. Yes. I, we'll separate those two words out that came out as one. Yeah. Uh, um, but then trying to figure out how do we clothe ourselves and live in that identity and like such easy church words to say stuff it's easier to preach than it is to live right yeah, like you want, in, in, uh, by the way if you want to get even a, make it a little more difficult if there's a relationship that there's division in and you're a part of that division and in that relationship as a christian you always have the responsibility even if you are the one who has been wronged or feel you've been wronged in the situation mm-hmm. to move towards the person towards tr- trying to right the relationship yeah uh, Matthew 5 uh, says, if you realize that you have done something to mm. a brother, yep. and Matthew 18 mm. yep. says, if somebody has done something against you, and in both cases, you're supposed to move towards the person to make them aware of this reality with the hope that you'll find a repentant brother or sister and be able to enter into a process of reconciliation. And, and I think that's what Paul is getting at here is you can't be neutral in this and just say, Hey, I'm out. Right. That you they have did a something to me. And then until they come to me, I, yep. then we just, this is the way it is. No, if you feel like somebody has done something to you, you have responsibility. If you know you, or you hear that somebody has been offended by something or hurt, hurt, been hurt by something you did. Now you have a responsibility right. to go and address that. So no matter what side of the equation you're on, you're if on the hook. If there's a rift in the relationship, you're, you're on, on the, the hook. Okay. <laughs> Love that for us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but the, but actually the beautiful picture, if you take Matthew 5 and Matthew 18, is that in the ideal situation, 
you would have uh, two individuals who are on other sides of the town who are in a relationship and both of them realize there's a rift in the relationship and they start walking towards mm -hmm. town to get to the They're other person together. and they meet in the middle, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. That's good. Now this one, you know, we talked about how some of this plays out on social media. So I think this is probably coming from that headspace. Sure. Should making the church aware of wolves in sheep's clothing, or I'm assuming they're meaning false teachers there, yep. uh, be done in-house, or should it be done publicly, pointing them out so that uh, the world knows that they're not speaking on behalf of the church? Uh, I think it depends. Yeah. Um, again, in a lot of these things, there's context. So there's, there's principles, and then there's context, and we have yeah. to be able to apply those things. The first thing I want to be sure of, you better be sure that it's a wolf and not just a sheep that has a, a different color wool than you're used to. Okay. All right. That's a beautiful analogy. <laughs> Pull it apart for us so we understand uh, what you're saying there. I, you know, like, I wonder sometimes a lot of people who feel the need to call out people. Right. Um, are those people really wolves or are they just Christians who don't agree with you on right. all sorts of issues, right? Right. We, we talk, we've talked many times, we'll continue to talk on this uh, podcast about differentiating between what issues are really gospel issues, like yeah. closed-handed, closed yeah. fist, you're not a follower this, of Jesus, you're not a follower right. of Jesus, and which are those things that are issues of dispute, issues of conscience, uh, yeah. where we are reading scripture differently, but we're still reading with the intent that we think yeah. we understand God's word to us and we, we understand God's yeah. word differently. So you would still be a brother, but right. you're going to look so at that I'm differently. I'm saying like yeah, okay. that person is not actually a wolf. I've just never seen a sheep with that color wool before. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I, and I have misidentified, right? Okay. So you better be darn sure if you're going to call somebody out as a wolf, that they're really a wolf and they're not just another sheep that look different mm -hmm. than you. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, that, that's my very first, uh, qualification <laughs> yep. here. Okay. Then I think the issue is uh, sometimes where has the has the thing that has been said been said publicly and broadly to all people and therefore right. should be addressed publicly and broadly in front of other people? Right. Or is it something that has been addressed in a different forum and should then be addressed in that forum? Right. right. If okay. you have a relationship with the person, or even if you don't, if you have the ability to go talk to them personally one-on-one -on -one first, um, maybe do that first, mm -hmm. have a conversation, make sure that, you know, you've raised your concerns, you've given them an opportunity to, to either correct you or defend themselves. That would be my first all mm. the time. Yeah. Yeah. That's um, fair. And, and, yeah. and within the context of the, the church, how I will often deal with things is like, we live in this world where if I was just busy calling out people and calling out things, we just spend all, all our time just calling out people and things. Yeah. Is it actually affecting the community that you're in? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> right? That's a good like, question to ask. Like, is this false teacher teaching something that is actually impacting and affecting the community to which you are responsible for? By the way, uh, not everybody is responsible for shooting the wolves. Hmm. The shepherd is responsible, not the sheep. Okay. So we don't need a bunch of sheep armed. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I go on social media and I think the sheep have all armed themselves. This is a bad. <laughs> this is a bad scene. <laughs> this is the start of a revolt, actually. Uh, <laughs> right. Yeah. Like uh, on that point, what Derek was just saying, like like our responsibility is first and foremost to preach the truth and not to go after the wolves. Right. Love that. Like that. Like just try to help people to try so that they have the ability to recognize what's false in the first place. Yeah. Like, like that. That's so important because I think like. Often and you know That's, it's been that said before so that we like the church and, and Christians have been known for what we're against, not what we're for. Yeah, yep. absolutely. Like, true. We need to be primarily focused on that. And, and admittedly, I've seen ministries and I've seen preachers where they go after the wrongs in the world far more than they do the, the preaching the truth. But in, and you know that's what we're called to is to be focused on the truth. Paul tells us like like focus your mind on that, mm. and, and that's I think the way in which you truly equip people for yep. recognizing the wolves. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, you're just you're not gonna have enough time in the day. Yeah, it's no. just a witch hunt too, right? Like, like you don't want to be calling up Derek every time. You're not man. sure if someone on Twitter is wrong. Uh, <laughs> Actually, I would love for you to do that. Uh, Text two two six. No, please don't. <laughs> 
well, our, our goal is to equip the saints yeah, that's so, so that good. you would be able yeah. to recognize, hey, what I just saw on Twitter, on YouTube, that's not good for my soul. And, and now we're equipping the uh, the sheep to go in the right direction. And in a world of being self-deceived, it's it's easy to mistake going after the wolves when really what you're trying to do is puff yourself up. Yeah. Yeah. Build up your pride. Yeah. I've got it right. They've got it wrong. Yeah. How could these people be so misled? Yeah. It just makes me feel good to put others down. I also recognize, as Derek said, like some some sheep look different and, and some sheep are, are wounded. Oh, uh, that's good. Like, I mean, and, and a wounded and sheep bite. will bite, will bite, bite. back. It, you might you might be going after someone where the first thing you should do is actually be caring for their yeah. soul. That's like, so hey, good. Um, yeah. oh. a, a friend of mine messaged me something yesterday. <laughs> I could have, I could have been upset with him and I'm like, uh, you okay? <laughs> so anyways, we, he was fine. Like, it was just a miss. Uh, it was actually an auto correct problem with texting. <laughs> anyways, we clarify what was going on. Uh, and we're just kind of joking. I'm like, Hey, he's like, thanks for checking in. Yeah. yeah. Everything's fine. Just auto correct. I'm like, cool. I'm glad, I, glad that was my first reaction. I, I, I assumed it mm. was, everything was fine, but, uh, you know, that's something mm. we should do a little bit more often. Well, that leans right into that Spurgeon quote that you had, right? Like yeah. better to be wrong about that and get accidentally offended. Yeah. yeah. And, I love that. Yeah. Um, so, Derek, you answered this question on Sunday. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not trying to expose you here, but I think you read it wrong. Oh. Or at least I read it differently than you read okay. it. Okay. So the question is, how can you approach someone who is, uh, who's offended you? I'm assuming there was a you in there somewhere, but feel they are spiritually superior to you. So you read it as that person feels they're spiritually superior to you. And I thought... I thought this was someone saying like, hey, I'm, I've got someone who is spiritually over me. Oh, but I feel they are spiritually superior yeah. to me. Yeah, that's how I read it anyways. So okay. I just want to make sure either reading gets well, handled. It, I would say then you can skip past the first part that I talked about, which was really like, hey, like just make sure that you're coming at this from a pattern because you're already coming at it from a, a position of humility, right? Right, yeah. This person is more spiritual than me. Right. But don't be in like intimidated by that because our superiority of our spirituality only comes from Christ, right? right. Like, and then we I all know, get there the There is no yeah. superiority. The ground mm -hmm. is level at the foot of the Christ. This is one of the beautiful things is like, mm -hmm. I should be open to having, you know, any brother or sister call me out, no matter how long they've been following Jesus. If they see mm -hmm. something that's askew in my life, that's mm -hmm. God's gift to me. If they're actually spiritually superior, that's the way they'll treat it. Yeah, that's they'll, fair. They'll actually, actually yeah. receive it as like, well, thank you for coming to me and making me aware of my blind spot here because mm -hmm. true spiritual <laughs> superiority is a recognition of how fatally sinful yeah. I am, right? That's so good. And all three of us have an experience in student ministry, and there's nothing more cutting than a teenager just like straight up savagely calling you out with yep. like absolutely no cushioning. <laughs> You're like, oh, but you're so right. <laughs> and, yeah. and just being like, well, I got to eat that. Let's, yeah. That's just on me. Hum uh. Humility <laughs> is, will be, will be the revelation that they've actually like, they are being sanctified in their journey towards Jesus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. So I got another one specifically uh, handed to me that's directed at you, Derek. Okay. So when you are, uh, did my wife send this in? No, no. Okay. Uh, it was uh, one of our young people <laughs> wanted to know when okay. you're washing your face, at what point do you stop? Oh, I already got this question. <laughs> then this is good. I don't. Okay. All right. I body you just wash. Don't, you just keep going. Just Why would I? Right up the dome. You okay. just you just take that loofah, <laughs> scrub okay. the face, loofah and right, right over the head, okay. you're done. Like you're, this So you're exfoliating as well. One of the beauties... Uh, you know, like uh, I would highly recommend baldness to to all individuals who want to be efficient, <laughs> who want to be wise stewards okay. of their money. All right. Okay. Uh, all, all you you don't you don't need to get haircuts. It's fair. You can do it. It's you a DIY need, situation. You don't need shampoo and conditioner anymore. That's right. Okay. Especially me. I got oily skin, so okay. that's why it shines so well. <laughs> well, I'm glad we did that deep dive. Uh, I. I did that one specifically with one actual question left, so we didn't end on that. Okay. Note because okay. I felt like that was not going to be the right way to end. That was Marin's question. It I sure believe. was. I wasn't going to expose her, but uh, her mother already <laughs> did. Her mother exposed her to me yesterday. You're very welcome for that. Um, okay. So I'll start with you, Daryl, and then we'll flip over to Derek, and then we'll wrap up here. If I have something against my neighbor or brother, but I forgive them, 
do I have to tell them or can I just forgive them <laughs> and not have anything to do with them anymore? <laughs> Essentially just walk away from the relationship. I'm sorry for laughing, but this is like, this I is love so this good. question. I love this question because it's real, right? It's yeah, a like, yeah, no, no, like no. I don't want to have to deal with this. I'm just going to forgive. <laughs> yeah. Because there's so many oh, times people I, offend you. I, yeah. I've been there, man. This is why I laugh. Like, and this people is hurt we, you and yeah. they don't even know it, right? And yeah. you're like, so do I have to actually like make this a thing now? Yeah. And like... Put it on display when I could just be like, ah, we're fine. Yeah. So yeah. I'm starting with you, Daryl, because Chuckles over here interrupted me. All right. <laughs> I, I'm so just trying to figure out where that, that last question about washing your face came because it's not it's not in my notes here. So I, like, I specifically did, wanted to blindside Derek with did that. Did I one. did yeah. I doze off for a second? Uh, I'm like, what, <laughs> what, what, what just happened? All right. So uh, great great question. Um, do I have to tell them? Um, I, I'm gonna say. Um, Yes, if if at all possible, uh, you're you're gonna have mm -hmm. to tell them. Um, I, I touched on this uh, in in my um, question on on Sunday uh, after the sermon, where I talked about the idea of incarnational ministry mm -hmm. um, that that Jesus came to the earth to to walk with us, to minister to us directly. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and now he has given us that ministry now to go to other people directly, to uh, to be in their space, that we don't want to just have ministry from a distance, but, uh, but close up. And, and so, and that's how we um, live out what Christ has called us, what he has called us to. And so in the idea of forgiving someone, I, I think you do have to go to them and let them know that they have been forgiven and that you would seek after restoration. Mm -hmm. um, that, that That's an important aspect of the forgiveness. It's going to start first in your heart. Mm -hmm. like it's going to start on a personal level, but it's going to go beyond that. And, and so I think that is incredibly important. But I don't know if the the, the follow-up question where it's asked, uh, essentially, can I walk away from the friendship? Yeah. And, and I don't know if you are commanded, though you have forgiven and have extended the invitation for restoration, if that restoration results in an ongoing friendship. Mm. Um that might it might be that the friendship is going to look dramatically different because of the offense that has happened um and and you need to recognize that i don't think that the goal is to get back to the friendship mm, um I, I think the goal in this is actually um and i know this might sound a little scary for some of us but it's actually when you forgive someone like that's actually a discipleship moment in their life Ooh. where you can actually help them to become a, a better follower of Christ because they have received uh, correction, forgiveness, restoration, all of this with the hope that we're growing in our relationship first and foremost with Christ. Uh, and it's not about actually restoring the friendship because I've experienced mm. this where someone has sought to restore the friendship above that call to follow Christ. Oh, that's good. Um, I'll, I'll gloss over what has happened. Let's just get back to hanging out. Mm. And, and that's not where we're called to. But we're, we need to be pointing people to Jesus, even if that results in you're not as close as you once were. That might, I mean, that's part of what Paul is saying of well, why not suffer wrong? Like, hey, that's kind of taking a hit. You might not have the same level of friendship as you once have. Um, if you're desiring that reading this, it sounds like they want to walk away. Yeah, uh, yeah. So I would, I would challenge them a little bit on that of, are you walking away? Cause it's easier. Yeah. Um, or have you really sought restoration? So there's that side. Maybe I'll throw it back to Derek. Maybe mm. you can speak on it from that perspective. I, I feel like I covered this in what I was saying before, <laughs> which is you absolutely, if there is, a relationship in need of repair and you are aware of it, you have a responsibility to go to the person. Yep, no matter Even if side. they are completely unaware that something had taken place, your job is to go to them and say, hey, when this happened, here's how I felt. Like, here's how I experienced this. Um, like I said, the reconciliation uh, and the restoration of relationship, I think you have a obligation to be open to that. Mm -hmm. but there is a requirement on the other person 
to actually repent. Yeah. And repentance involves action, not just words. That's good. That's yeah. Helpful. There's actually things that you do to show that you're repentant and not just sorry that you're dealing with the consequences of your sin. Yep. Um, it's sorry about the sin. Yeah. <laughs> right. I'm sorry about the sin, not just that like this has made things more uncomfortable for me, more difficult for me. And the reality is, as Daryl has already said, the friendship may not look the same mm -hmm. on the other side of that. That sin has consequences that carry forward. I think you should probably remember you're going to spend eternity with this person if <laughs> they are a follower of Jesus. Yeah. And Maybe that's what start we're to get about, yeah. to work on that right now. It's good. It's good. Because <laughs> eternity is a long time to avoid yeah. somebody. It's true. It's literally <laughs> endless. Okay. All right. Yeah. That's a, that's a, a daunting reminder <laughs> from your lead pastor. Uh, so friends, we're going to wrap up here. I just wanted to say like, as I'm reading through these questions, uh, it feels like people are feeling the weight of this, right? Like the, yeah. that forgiveness is messy. Yeah. It's going to be costly and sometimes really, really painful, right? And Paul even calls us to that. And uh, just hopeful uh, as we look to the end of this week, as we look to going into Easter weekend to be reminded that the work, the price has already been paid. The cost has already been fulfilled by the work of Jesus on the cross. So I'm excited to gather again. Listen, I... I, I think I said this to you, Andrew, like, I'm always excited for Easter Sunday, <laughs> but coming off the last two weeks, I've, Feels never, like a break. I've never been more excited <laughs> to preach the resurrection Yeah, because of we Christ, need it. because, because yeah. this, we need is, it. this yeah. is our hope, this is yeah. our, our good news in the midst of a lot of the difficulties and mm. and struggles uh, of this world, like, this is, mm. the, this is the hope, if Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead, you and I can be too. It's so good. So friends, live in that hope, live in that identity as we've talked about, and we are excited to worship with you this weekend, and we will see you next week.